such a warm and wonderful welcome. I really am, am thrilled to be here. I've heard about Biola for so many years and have met so many of your graduates. It's great to finally be standing in your space. So thanks for having me here. My understanding is that we are gathered here this week to address how it is, I bet that will help, will that help? Okay, to address how it is that biblical training and actual Christian practice unite. According to your literature, that's what the Tory conference is all about, and that was the initiative that birthed it 76 years ago. You know, and I heard that I'd been married for 17 years, I was a little stunned, you know. I didn't realize that it had been that long, we've been busy. <laughs> But you've been doing this for 76 years. 76 years, that intersection between biblical training and Christian practice. The topic for this year, of course, is Sabbath. And I understand you've already committed some hard thinking to that biblical mandate. And that corner of time that Lauren Winner describes as the cessation from the rhythms of work and world a time wholly set apart, I like that. I would probably describe Sabbath as the practice, the practice that a Christian takes on, where we as God's people make room in our lives to remember who it is we serve, to reorient ourselves toward God. He is creator, we as creation. He as limitless and we as incredibly finite. So you have learned about Sabbath. You learned that it was first spoken at creation, yes. The paradigm for space and time and God's perfect plan. You've learned how the practice of Sabbath was instituted at Sinai when a race of slaves, think about that for a moment, a race of slaves who had never had a day off in their lives were offered this amazing gift that one day out of seven you will rest. No, you will rest. It is a command. When this people who were not a people became the people of God. Yes. All right. So you've learned all about the Sabbath and how this Sabbath has shaped the people of God. Well, this afternoon we're going to turn the page. And we're gonna turn the page from biblical training to Christian practice. And we're gonna approach Christian practice from an angle that does not often occur to the typical Christian. The question at hand, how does the Sabbath practice of moderation and restraint, how does a Sabbath lifestyle affect the way we work, eat, build, buy, and sell? How does Sabbath affect us as we think about limited productivity and therefore limited consumption? And how does this affect the believer in their everyday lives? From the coffee shop to the grocery store, from the gas station to the laundromat. You ready? Good. All right, in chapters 38 and 39 of the book that bears his name, our forefather in the faith, Job, is hammered with a series of questions. The intent of the interrogation to remind him that he is creature, not creator. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning? Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or caused the dawn to know its place? Have you entered into the springs of the sea or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? When I hear these questions voiced, I respond just as Job, surely not I. I can hardly understand these mysteries, let alone mimic or duplicate them. Only the master of the universe can do such things. Rather, I respond to these astounding aspects of creation with worship. As a daughter of Eve, I'm so designed. So my heart cries out with the psalmist and with our worship team this afternoon, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, you who's displayed your splendor above the heavens. This is as it should be. Our hearts should be filled with worship when we see the beauties of creation. But the scriptures teach us that God actually expects a further response from those who call him Lord. 
And this response is the believer's God-ordained, character-stretching, character-confining duty of creation care. Let's begin at the beginning. In Genesis chapter one, God reveals his plan of creation. You've studied this. The interdependence of the cosmos is laid out within the literary framework of a perfect week. As you've learned on the seventh day, God is enthroned above the cosmos and he rests. This rest communicates not only his complete satisfaction in what has gone before, but it also communicates that the perfect balance of God's ideal plan is dependent on the sovereignty of the creator. Notice the penultimate climax of the piece. On the sixth day, a steward is enthroned, under the creator, but over the creation. Then God said, let us make Adam, that's humanity, in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule. Whereas the outworking of God's ideal design is dependent on the sovereignty of the creator, we see here that it is also dependent on the obedience of the steward, whose privilege and responsibility is to facilitate the plan by living out their lives as a reflection of God's image. This was God's perfect plan. The role of the human steward within the creator order is further specified in Genesis chapter two. Yahweh Elohim took the human and put him into the Garden of Eden to tend it, la'ovda, for those of you who've got your Hebrew down, and to guard it, la shomra. The larger message of these accounts is clear. The garden belongs to Yahweh. It belongs to Yahweh, but Adam has been given the privilege to rule and the responsibility to care for this garden under the sovereignty of their divine Lord. And so God's ideal is set in motion, a world in which Adam would succeed in constructing the human civilization by directing and harnessing the abundant resources of the garden under the wise director of the creator. Here there would always be enough. Progress would not necessitate pollution. Expansion would not require extinction. The privilege of the strong would not demand the deprivation of the weak. And humanity would succeed in these goals because of the guiding wisdom of God. But we all know the story. Humanity rejected the perfect plan and chose autonomy instead. And because of the authority offered to humanity by their God-given position within the created order, humanity's choice cast the entire cosmos into disarray. And as Roman eight, Romans 8 details for us, even the creation, because of Adam, was subjected to futility. You can translate that as frustration. And enslaved to corruption, verses 21 tells us. So the Christian community, us, we readily recognize the results of Adam's choice when it comes to the realities of human relationships poverty, greed, violence, we recognize that these result from Adam's choice and we readily embrace our role as the redeemed community to stand in opposition to these societal norms. But rarely, it seems, does the church reflect upon the impact of humanity's rebellion on the garden. And rarely, it seems, do we consider how the reality of redemption in our lives should redirect our attitude toward the same. So let's turn our eyes from Genesis to the next chapter of the great story, the story of Israel. Now, many of you may not yet have considered this, but Israel stands as the first example, the first model of God's relationship with the redeemed and landed citizenry in a fallen world. The document that articulates the national constitution of that citizenry is none other than the book of Deuteronomy. In this book, whose legal traditions reach back into the earliest shadows of Israel's settlement, there's a continuing chorus. If the people will remember the law of God, they will be blessed and they will live and prosper. But if they forget and therefore disobey, 
they will not prosper. To obey is life, to disobey death, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. The incarnation of this blessing in the life of Israel is the land, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. But throughout the book of Deuteronomy, Yahweh makes it expressly clear that the land of Canaan is a gift. It is the land that Yahweh swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. But in the language of ancient international diplomacy, the land of Canaan is a land grant, a gift, a gift of territory from the suzerain, that would be Yahweh, to his vassal, that would be Israel. And of course, land grants could be recalled. Thus, although the offspring of Abraham are invited to abide upon the land with joy and productivity, the book of Deuteronomy is eminently clear that the land will never truly be theirs. Rather, as the cursed sections of Deuteronomy 28 and the transitional materials from 29 to 34 detail, Yahweh retains the right to reclaim his land, to uproot his people, quote, from their land in anger and fury and in great wrath, and to cast them into another land as it is to this day. In other words, if Israel the vassal fails to keep covenant with Yahweh the suzerain, they will be thrown out on their keisters. That's what that means. And in other words, as well, as it was in the garden, so it is in the land of Israel. God owns the land, and it's humanity's privilege to live on it. Thus, both the land and its produce, and even its animal inhabitants, don't actually belong to Israel. Go figure. They belong to Israel's suzerain lord. That would be Yahweh. Now, this reality is most evident in the laws of Israel within the laws of tithe, first fruits, and the firstborn. In Israel's world, as in ours, a portion of a citizen's income belonged to the central government, and a subject kingdom was expected to pay an annual percentage of its gross national product to its overlord. In Israel's pastoral and agricultural world, this means that a percentage of their crops and flocks belong to higher authorities. So in Israel's theocratic government, you guys know what theocratic means, right? God rules Israel. Yahweh commands, you shall surely tithe all the produce of your seed, that which comes forth from the field year by year, and you shall eat in the presence of Yahweh your God, in the place where he chooses to place his name. The tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, the firstborn of your herd and your flock, in order that you may learn to fear Yahweh all of your life. It goes on to say, you shall set aside the firstborn males that are born of your herd and your flock for Yahweh your God. You shall not work with the firstborn of your herd or shear the firstborn of your flock, Rather, you and your household shall eat it year by year in the presence of Yahweh your God in the place that Yahweh chooses. Also, this will be the priest's due from the people. When anyone sacrifices an ox or a sheep, they must give the priest the shoulder and two cheeks and the stomach. You shall also give him the first fruits of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the first fleece when you shear your sheep. For Yahweh your God has chosen him and his sons from all of your tribes forever to stand and serve in the name of Yahweh. So what we see here is that Israel, like the cultures of Syria, Palestine surrounding them, used the tithe as a regular tax. But unlike surrounding practices, Deuteronomic law interprets the tithe as not just a tax, but a celebratory gift to God. One that was to be enjoyed and shared by the members of the family as an act of devotion at the central sanctuary. Indeed, Deuteronomic law sees the practice of tithe as celebratory. All the annual gatherings at the tabernacle and the temple, they were intended to be huge barbecues with the extended family. That's the idea. Come on, let's party. That's the plan. But here we also find the divinely authorized taxation system. The ultimate mark that the people of Israel are only tenants of Yahweh's land is that the produce of the land ultimately belongs to their landlord. That would be Yahweh. 
This is demonstrated by the fact that Israel is commanded to make regular offerings of the land's produce to the divine king throughout the year. In fact, the old legal core of Deuteronomy is introduced and concluded by imperatives regarding Israel's tenant status. Deuteronomy 12.10 opens the law code with the following, when you cross the Jordan and live in the land which Yahweh your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest, there's that word again, from all your enemies around so that you may live in security, then you will bring to the place in which Yahweh your God will choose to place his name all that I'm commanding you. Your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hands, your choices, votive offerings that you vow to Yahweh. And you shall rejoice, there's that big barbecue again, in the presence of Yahweh your God. The law code closes with the same command. When you have entered the land, which Yahweh your God is giving you as an adherence, and you possess it and you live in it, you'll take from the first of all the produce of your ground, which you shall bring in from your land that Yahweh your God is giving you, and you'll put it in a basket, and you'll go to the place where Yahweh your God chooses to place his name. And you'll go to the priest who's in the office at time, and you'll say, I declare this day to Yahweh your God that I've entered the land which Yahweh swore to give us. And then the priest will take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar, and you shall testify before Yahweh your God. And here is the oldest creed in the book. My father was a wandering Aramean. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Therefore, I have now brought the first of the produce of the land, which who has given me? Which, Yahweh, which you have given me, O Yahweh. In sum, Deuteronomy makes it crystal clear that this good land of Canaan and its produce do not actually belong to the Israelites, but belong to Yahweh. The tribes of Israel are only his tenants, appointed to their nachalah, that's a Hebrew word for patrimony, inherited territory, according to God's good pleasure. And again, as it was in the garden, so it is in Israel. The land and its resources belong to God, not to humanity. Humanity is invited to live on the land, to prosper, but there are rules. And much like the Sabbath, as one day in seven goes back to God, one portion in ten is his as well. All right, let's turn the corner and talk a little bit about this land and agriculture. What are the rules regarding the way Israel cultivates and uses the resources given to her? Well, in concert with Israel's understanding that it was Yahweh who actually owned the land of Canaan, a number of laws address the long-term stewardship of the land's fertility. The core of these laws is our core topic for the week, the Sabbath rest, a command to humanity to regularly cease production so that the land, like humanity, might be allowed an opportunity to replenish itself. So in Exodus 23, verses 10 through 12, we read, you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield, but the seventh year you're gonna let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat and whatever they leave, the wild animal may eat. You're to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you'll do your work, but on the seventh you will rest in order that your ox and your ass may rest as well. That actually is a technical term, by the way. There's a difference between donkey and ass, so I have to use the word ass. I'm just sorry. Can I say that one more time? Okay. <laughs> okay. Whenever we come to this, you know, in like the Christmas carols, my kids freak out. Okay. <laughs> the equid of questionable heritage. All right and the son of your female servant and the immigrant may be refreshed. I went to Bible college and I learned the word ass, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> Leviticus, <laughs> Leviticus reiterates and particularizes this law, but during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest. Stop laughing now, okay. Um, <laughs> A Sabbath belonging to Yahweh. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard, your harvest after growth. You shall not reap the grapes of your interim vines. You will not gather, just in case you don't have the details down. Rather, the Sabbath growth of the land will be your food, belonging to you 
your male servant, your female servant, your hired man, your temporary resident, and the immigrants among you. Even your domesticated beast and the wild animal that is in your land shall have its crops. Now, the sort of following, sorry, I should have flipped to that one, the sort of uh, following that is described here not only aided in the recovery of fertility, it also broke the natural cycle of noxious plant pests and diseases. Such fallowing also facilitated the grazing of livestock on the resting fields, livestock that would very efficiently deliver their restorative nitrogen and phosphorus-rich manure, that would be poop, to those same fallow fields. See, study Old Testament, we've got great stuff going on. Um, Interestingly, this idea of grazing livestock or allowing your livestock to graze on fallow fields is still outlawed in many regions of the United States by federal farm law. Crop rotation also assisted the ancient farmer with sustainable soil fertility, and as any organic farmer would tell us, and the history of urbanization of Mesopotamia dramatically illustrates, the continuous cultivation of a single crop in the same field depletes the soil of nutrients and encourages the proliferation of pests and diseases specific to that particular crop. In contrast, Israel's Sabbath law and its practice of crop rotation and the grazing of livestock enhanced the microbiology of the soil and the rotation of certain crops such as legumes actually restored nitrogen content. Moreover, as these laws required that a portion of the harvest remain in the field for the voiceless, we'll get there this evening, this system also guaranteed something that agriculturalists speak of as crop residue, that which remains in the field after the harvest and uh, is complete and thereby provides essential humus to the soil. All in all, we see that just as Israel's Sabbath law protected the long-term spiritual and physical health of the human populace, it also protected the long-term fertility and productivity of the land. Now then as now, such farming practices limited short-term yield. That is why organic products cost twice as much as non-organic products. Such farming practices limited short-term yield, but they help to ensure long-term productivity. And as current agricultural science is demonstrating, failure to provide for the long-term soil fertility by allowing the soil to rejuvenate itself, in other words, pushing the land to produce more than it is capable of, by the systemic reliance upon pesticides and chemical fertilizer leads to decreased, decreased fertility and eventually to sterility. It also leads to a devastating effect upon the poor. We'll get there tonight. But most importantly, in Israel's fallow law, we find a critical ideological principle. In Israel, it was not acceptable to take from the land everything that a populace could. Let me say that again slowly. In Israel, it was not acceptable to take from the land everything that a populace could. Rather, God's people were commanded to operate with the long-term well-being of the land as their ultimate goal. They were instructed to leave enough so that the land might be able to replenish itself for future harvests and future generations, even though such methods would cut into short-term profits. Why? Well, in Leviticus, because I'm Yahweh, says your God. The land is mine. In Deuteronomy, so that you shall prolong your days in the land. In other words, because this is Yahweh's land and Yahweh's produce, and Yahweh intends that his land be fruitful for the next generation of tenants. In sum, the politeia, the political structure of ancient Israel, taught that economic growth was not a viable excuse for the abuse of the land. Economic growth was not a viable excuse for the abuse of the land. And true economic well-being would come only from careful stewardship of the same. Okay, let's turn the page to the land and warfare. Even in the midst of the crisis of warfare, we find that God's people were commanded to treat creation with care. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19, there is a very interesting little law. When you besiege a city for many days to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees. When you build a strip mall, 
You shall not, oh, sorry. Okay, when you besiege a city for many days to make war against it in order to make a really cool new subdivision, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an ax against them. Indeed, you may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that it should be besieged by you? Only a tree that you know does not produce fruit may you destroy and cut down, and you may build your siege works against the city in which you are at war until it falls. Ancient Israel was blessed with an array of food-bearing trees. Oded Borowski lists the fig, olive, date, sycamore, that would be the fig-bearing sycamore, not the enormous sycamore of the United States, the apricot, carob, almond, pistachio, and walnut are all indigenous to Canaan as well as several that we cannot identify by means of their biblical labels. All of these trees face similar developmental realities. If maintained, they would produce for generations, but full maturity preceded production. Regarding the all-important all olive tree, Larry Steger, the archaeologist at Harvard University, reports that it takes five or six years for the tree to begin to flower and as many as 20 years to reach full maturity. Even then, they bear only once every other year. Steger states, quote, it is commonly said that one plants an olive yard for one's, not for oneself, but for one's grandchildren. Similarly, Stephen Cole, a seriologist, reports that the female date palm, a treasured source of preservable, calorie-rich fruit, quote, may take as long as 20 years before they produce their first fruit? 20 years. All right, I wanna see a show of hands of everyone who has not yet reached their 20th birthday. All right, you've got no fruit. <laughs> now I'd like to see everyone who has reached their 20th birthday. Now I wanna see everyone who's reached two 20 birthdays. <laughs> okay, I'm not going any higher. All right, 20 years. 20 years before it produces its first fruit. The crops born of these trees were a mainstay of the Iron II diet. Iron Age is simply the age of Israel's existence in the land. The importance of this food source to this sustenance economy cannot be overemphasized. It could be stored, it could be preserved, it kept them alive in times of famine. As we hear in 1 Kings 4, verse 25, the great dream of the Israelites was a level of national security and prosperity in which every citizen might, quote, live in safety, every man under his vine and his fig tree from Dan, even to Beersheba. So in light of the long-term bearing capacity of these food-bearing trees, it should be no surprise to us that one standard aspect of the Assyrian war machine was to wipe out vineyards and orchards. Who were the Assyrians, you may ask? Well, in my classes, I speak of them as the Borg of the ancient Near East. You know the quote, don't you? Yeah, resistance is futile, you shall be assimilated. Well, even the Borg were not as scary as the Assyrians. They were the first true empire in the ancient Near East. They came into view somewhere in the late third millennium. Their specialty was brutality and terrorism. That was their specialty, and they celebrated their violence by image and text in order to terrify their opponents into submission. And when they went to war, well, you didn't want to be there. According to historian Donner, famous quote, they would institute a level of destruction that disallowed rebirth. Institute a level of destruction that disallowed rebirth. These were the Assyrians. So it is no surprise that a standard aspect of the Assyrian war machine involved the decimation of a besieged enemy's vineyards and orchards. The goal? to cripple that city for decades beyond the actual assault, be that assault successful or not. Hence, this strategy and the threat of this strategy, because if you intimidate your enemy out of rebellion, you don't have to deal with him, this strategy was regularly communicated by the Assyrians by means of text and image, and we have those texts and images. So, for example, you are looking at a wall mural of Sargon II, which records his assault on the city of Ursul. I entered triumphantly, 
he boasts, into his pleasant gardens, the adornments of his city, which were overflowing with fruit and wine. They came tumbling down. His great trees, the adornment of his palace, I cut down like millet. The trunks of all those trees which I had cut down, I gathered together, heaped in a pile, and burned them with fire. Think for a moment about the farmers who have retreated into the city walls in order to save their lives and their children's lives. And as they stand on the wall, they watch the Assyrians for sport, chopping down the date palm grove that their great-grandfather planted and the, the palm grove that they know is the hope of their grandchildren's survival. This is the Assyrians. In the Suhu annals of Shalmaneser III, the king declares, we will go and attack the houses of the land of Suhu. We will seize his cities, we will cut down their fruit trees. Stephen Cole offers an encyclopedic collection of these texts and images, showing that this particular military strategy was indeed a staple of Assyrian warcraft. Michael Hazel demonstrates that the siege tactic actually wasn't new with the Assyrians, but it can be tracked back into the third millennia with the Hittites, the Babylonians, and even the Egyptians. His thesis, in fact, is that whereas the Assyrians would use this tactic to cripple a community's agricultural support system after a siege, the Egyptians would do it during or before the successful capture of a city, for the express purpose of building siege works. Interesting, we have an actual record of Tutmosis III from the New Kingdom using this method. And of course, our next question is why would Deuteronomy speak to this sort of environmental terrorism? Well, in sum, it is apparent that the systematic annihilation of orchards was a staple of ancient Near Eastern warfare well before the time of Israel's settlement in the land. What then might be Deuteronomy's rationale? This is a standard military tactic. Why does Israel not practice it? To quote Michael Hassel, Israel is forbidden from such retaliatory tactics because, quote, it would not be in Israel's interest to destroy the very resources that would later sustain them. Hmm. Hence, it would seem that in Israelite law, even national security did not justify the abuse of the land or the magnificent flora residing on it. Rather, in Israel, the fact that it took a generation for an olive orchard to come to full fruition deserved deference. And human enterprise was not a worthy excuse for wiping out the future productivity of the land. This makes me wonder it makes me wonder what those stripping Canada of its boreal forests for catalog paper production at a current rate of five acres a minute. Or those creating lunar landscapes, let me flip back the, from this one, lunar landscapes in eastern Kentucky by means of mountaintop removal coal mining, or those devouring 1.5 acres of rainforest a second, along with the 50,000 species a year that inhabit that acreage, might have to say about God's law to Israel. I wonder what God might have to say to those of us who are growing rich from these endeavors. In sum, the politeia of ancient Israel communicates that neither economic expansion national security, nor even personal economic viability were legitimate justification for the abuse of the land, or as we will see tonight, the abuse of the poor, the domestic, or the wild creature. Rather, all of these laws of land, tree, and creature communicate a similar theme. Israel was a tenant upon God's good land, a steward. As it was in the garden, so it was in Israel. The land, its produce, and its inhabitants belong to God, not to humanity. And each member of Israel's society stood responsible before God regarding their care of his resources. Each member of Israel's society. Obviously, we find here the kernel, the platform of a biblical theology of creation care. If I were to summarize the biblical principle into a single proverb, it would be this. The earth is the Lord's, 
and all it contains. You may make use of it in your need, but you will not abuse it in your greed. Or in more colloquial terms, this stuff ain't ours. I had to use that word, didn't I? This stuff ain't ours. And we cannot continue to live as though it is without consequence. Moreover, I find the connection between these laws of land care and Sabbath too close to ignore. In fact, it was this conference that drove me to start exploring the connection between land care and Sabbath. And I found that nearly every one of the laws of ancient Israel that address the care, the long-term stewardship of the land and its creatures hearken back to the Sabbath law. At creation, God structured time and space around the rest of the seventh day. He instructed us that we will best reflect his image if we imitate him in restraining our drive to produce. I'm going to say that again. We will best imitate him in restraining our drive to produce. If we discipline ourselves to cease, if we take one in seven to be instead of to do, Israel is given the same command. Rather than producing and consuming all they could, they are commanded to create a rhythm in their lives such that they regularly cease. And do you see that in their ceasing, they effectively declare the sovereignty of God to everyone around? For in their resting, they declare their confidence in something other than their ability to produce. When they stop, when they put the plow down, when they put the ox in the barn, they are saying to themselves and to their neighbors, even though the silo is not yet full, I will trust in God to provide for me. And I'm going to go home, and I'm going to be with my family, and I'm going to reflect on the fact that my identity goes beyond my function. My identity goes beyond my function. Moreover, in resting and allowing those things and creatures under their dominion to rest, they embraced a posture of restraint and maintained and supported the garden all around them. Just like us, Israel struggled with competing demands of a diverse society, insufficient yields, property loss, land tenure, poverty, and taxes. Or should I say, insufficient time, school bills, GREs, and bad cafeteria food. Actually, your cafeteria's pretty good. Um, they, they struggled just like us. And as we will discuss this evening, and I will give you hard data for, the community that was Israel during the Iron One and Two Ages was not making it. They were below subsistence, just like us, Israel struggled. But underlying their response to all of these challenges of life, at least in the law codes of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, was one central tenant. This land, these creatures are not ours. They are on loan to us. We must manage them well so that each is preserved. We are the ones created in the image of the Almighty, and our behavior makes a difference. We must take God at his word, that in response to our obedience, he himself will bring about the increase. Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. Short-term desperation management, which exhausts current resources in answer to the cry of the urgent, was not acceptable in Israel, and it should not be acceptable to God's new covenant people either. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.